ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you're based from where you're dialing in. A very warm welcome from us at Watson Farley Williams to our today's webinar on shipbuilding contracts and refund guarantees. My name is Christian Finnan. I'm a maritime partner based in our Hamburg office. Jointly with my fellow partner, Charles Buss, I would like to use the next hour or so to deal with shipbuilding contracts and refund guarantees, a topic which has received more recently an increased level of attention. This comes after a decade of less activity. As many of you may probably have witnessed due to the market downturn following the financial crisis in 2008, the decade from 2010 to 2020 uh, was focused on, let me call it, a substantial reorganization of the global merchant fleet. And to a large extent, such reorganization was driven by the changes to the financial environment the maritime sector is maneuvering in. But it seems the reshuffle of many parts of the world's fleet is now completed and many existing ships being fixed for a longer term employment we see a number of clients being more and more interested in and engaged with the idea of building ships. An aspect to watch out in this regard are re regulations coming into force, the protection of the environment, rules for recycling of ships, and alternative fuels to mention a few aspects, require owners and operators, together with charters, to investigate the potential of the new building of vessels. Additionally, the more recent upswing in the markets, certain at least, driven by tremendous demand, have added a further element to look into the opportunity of constructing new tonnage. In combination with the general need for a renewal of the global fleet, these reasons had already a significant effect on ordering activities of owners worldwide and constant activities are to be noted. This changing landscape influences the range of stakeholders and market participants, not only owners, operators and charterers, but also ship managers, investors, financiers, class societies and insurers are touched by said developments. As a consequence, in our daily practice, we do see a keen interest to understand the legal framework of shift construction. In this regard, one should not forget that those who started in the maritime sector since 2010 rarely had the opportunity to be involved in new building projects for those reasons already mentioned. This all having said, we think this webinar today should provide an introduction or a refresher on this topic. As already started, we are aiming to give you an overview about the status, as well as the conclusion and the key terms of typical building contracts and guarantees. I'm glad that my partner Charles Buss is joining us today. Based in London and a partner in the Dispute Resolution Group, Charles specializes in commercial banking and maritime litigation, as well as arbitration. In the maritime and offshore oil and gas sectors, Charles regularly acts for ship owners, charters, contractors, and others in relation to commercial disputes arising from construction contracts, charters, drilling contracts, ship share, ship share and purchase contracts, as well as cargo and marine insurance disputes. In the ship finance sector, Charles has acted for a large number of lending banks, syndicates, financial institutions in disputes, enforcements, restructurings, and insolvencies. It is worth to note that Charles has co-authored the second edition of the Law of Ship Mortgage, the industry most comprehensive English law textbook on the topic. Given the importance of refund and advance payment guarantees for a shipbuilding project, and based on the experience with contentious situations around the construction of ships and the demand for repayment, Charles is well placed to give us an overview on guarantees. As an hour is passing by quickly, and we will only be touch, able to touch the surface anyway, let us turn to the building contracts. As mentioned, after a decline in ordering of new vessels due to reasons stated 
plus more recent concerns related to the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen in the first half of 2020, ship owners, at least in certain segments, have reasons to be more optimistic about their business and are keen to expand their fleet not only by purchasing secondhand vessels, but also by ordering new buildings. We understand from certain industry sources that around 40% of the ship owners will be very likely to purchase newly constructed vessels by the end of 2022. This positive trend seems at the moment focusing mainly on container ships, bulk and multi-purpose carriers, while the appetite for new building of ships in other segments, especially in the cruise sector, for some obvious reason remains rather limited and is inspected to continue to be. Although it's fair to say that the cruise industry has driven ship construction over those years where the owners of merchant ships were rather passive. It goes without saying that orders for construction of merchant vessels are mainly placed at Chinese, South Korean and Japanese shipyards. Interestingly, given the demand for merchant vessels, German and other European shipyards which have been rather active in the area of cruise, naval or yacht construction, or have built special type vessels, are now looking into projects around the construction of merchant ships. If this turns into live projects, it remains to be seen for the moment. Another important reason is the desire, respectively the need, to modernize the global fleet in order to comply with emission regulation requirements. To our understanding, this drives around 70% of the ship owners to have an interest in investing in their fleet to reduce emissions combined with a plan to replace old vessels. A shipbuilding contract established a relatively long and hopefully close commercial and legal relationship between the owner as buyer and the shipyard as seller. This starts from first talks until completion and delivery of the vessel. Therefore, negotiating and drafting a building contract requires care and diligence to ensure a solid position on the contract being at least one cornerstone for the success of your project. Usually, the first step is to find a yard, which may be able to build the vessel which the owner is keen to add to its fleet. And the yard needs to be able to build the vessel within a time window, which makes commercial sense for the owner. An owner may have its direct uh, contact to yard, for example, from previous projects. Alternatively, as for the sale and purchase of secondhand tonnage, the contact between the owner and the yard may be established via broker channels. After this first contact has been established, the next relevant step would be the entering into a letter of intent setting out the key aspects of your project, the type of vessel, the design, number of vessels, including options you may order, purchase price, delivery windows, to just mention a few. Although it's dependent on the content of the agreement, in the most cases, such LOI would be a non-binding declaration between the parties, setting out the intention to conclude a building contract based on certain key elements. Assuming the LOI is drafted to be of a non-binding nature, the project is then subject to further negotiations and in particular, the execution of the building contract. Therefore, the owner and the builder now enter into negotiations about commercial, technical and legal issues as well as the general wording of the contract. The final contract package comprises the contract itself, very detailed specifications, as well as plans and drawings of the vessel to be built. In addition, you will have guarantees securing refund or advance payments. Charles will come to this in a minute. As you see on the list here, there are certain standard forms of building contracts which may be used as a starting point. Those have been developed by certain industry associations, as you can see, depending on the region. So you will find samples from Japan, Western Europe, Norway, or even a BIMCO sample. Many of the yards will have developed their own to a certain extent based on these samples. 
not surprisingly, if you start looking, reviewing and negotiating your contract, the most of them are rather builder friendly precedents. What you need in your contract in the very first place is a description of the vessel. This description is reached by the terms of the contract and a reference to the specifications, the makers list and the GA plan. There is an interaction between the contract and the, these enclosures forming an integral part of it. it. Particularly for the specifications, makers list and GA plan, technical teams need to review and confirm. It might be your, that you have an internal technical team or you hire technical consultants. Sometimes we have seen that lawyers could add, could add some value to those in the first place looking very much technical document. Your contract will then set out the basic terms of the vessel. As you can see, they have the main engine, you have dead weight, speed, fuel consumption, and many, many other things. We will see that a clear description is very much needed for other terms of the contract. You will have to agree on a classification on rules and regulations. As an example, the future flag, because the yard wants to know for which flag the vessel is to be constructed. As a buyer, if you have already made a decision on your flag, that is good. Otherwise, at least try to add a term in the contract that you under certain conditions may change your flag. This could be linked to certain costs as a, as a modification. Apart from that, there will be usually terms and obviously you should keen to have on compliance with recycling rules, quality control, health and safety, and from a practical point of view, the marking of materials which are ordered and then stored for your particular vessel. The vessel is there to be designed and delivered is the main obligation of the builder, quite obviously, and the buyer's obligation is obviously to pay the contract price. That key obligation is not as for the acquisition of secondhand vessels, one payment, it's, it's in certain installments. And you link those to certain milestones uh, as the construction uh, proceeds. So you have usually a provision of a refund guarantee, a steel cutting, key laying, launching and delivery event where certain installments have to be made. We see these days a 40% being paid before delivery in the pre-delivery phase usually split and 10% uh, portions, plus a 60% uh, portion up on delivery. The five times 20 installments uh, of previous times, we do not really see in particular uh, due to the lower availability of um, uh, pre-delivery financing. And once you have paid your installments, uh, there is the risk of you lose your installments being paid because the buyer, the builder is going in insolvency or there is another reason for justified cancellation. So that is the refund guarantee topic we will see in a more detail uh, from Charles. Another very important term, and I touched on that earlier, is the question of the delivery date um, for your vessel, because if you order a vessel, you have probably already then, but maybe later, certain agreements reached with the charter of your vessel. So vacancy are to be met as well as finance commitment periods you want to look after. In that regard, it's worth to know that you be very careful in having a difference between contractual delivery date and the actual delivery date. The reason is you agree on a time when the yard should deliver the vessel, and that may be different to the date when the vessel is actually delivered, because from that point in time, further rights and duties may occur. As you will see in practice, you always, in the most cases at least, there will be reasons for extension. 
These could be, to just touch on very high level, changes, modifications, and extras to design and construction, which we'll see, we see when looking at a separate clause in the, in the most contracts. It could be bias default. For example, you do not pay as you should, or you do not provide supplies as we will see later. Or, of course, the force majeure the yard could raise. Directly related to delay, you look into liquidated damages in your contract. The main obligation of the builder is to design, construct, build, and deliver the vessel according to the building contract. This means, as I mentioned earlier, it needs to be in compliance with the description of the vessel and in compliance with the timeline agreed. You will see usually in the contract thresholds with regard to the speed, the fuel consumption, and the dead weight, dead weight in addition to the timeline as agreed. In case of non-compliance after a grace period for delay or the thresholds exceeded, a buyer should be entitled to liquidated damages as per the contract. This means an US dollar, usually US dollar amount per day for delay or for decrease of a ton dead weight or in, uh, percentage of not speed or excessive fuel consumption up to a certain cap of total liquidated damages. In contrast, the parties may also agree on an increase of the purchase price if, for example, the vessel is tendered ready for delivery prior to the actual contractually agreed date as an incentive to the builder. On the timeline, the most common cancellation of a contract is the delayed delivery. This right to cancel may occur after a certain system under the contract. As indicated, there's always a grace period, usually 30 days of delay, which do not cause anything. It's the right of the yard to use the 30 days. Could be more, could be less, but that is the usual day, the time, the time you get as a yard. Thereafter, liquidated damages kick in. For example, for 100, the next 180 days, which would lead, as per description, to an adjustment of the contract price in favor of uh, the buyer. Once having looked at permissible delay, we look at that on the default system, the cancellation right may occur after two, in that example, 210 days where the buyer can cancel. Very important is, before you cancel, carefully calculate and consider what has happened to your project. Because the premature cancellation could be a repudiatory breach by the buyer, which would give tremendous rights to the builder. So bear in mind that there is an ordinary delay the yard may have the right to take. There's an importance of factoring in permissible delay, which is the set force majeure, or even bias default to be delayed with certain things. And as you can surely imagine, when it comes to your calculation and you then cancel, the yard may say, well, you have caused that delay. Why are you now canceling? We see all these uh, with, uh, in the light of the reef and guarantees later. But now that you have heard of a particular right a yard wants usually to have under a contract is the subcontracting. This is um, the right of the yard uh, to subcontract certain elements of the vessel to be constructed. There is always um, a discussion uh, about the question, does that, this have to be in the country of the yard, that the yard is based or outside? And it, also you will know that certain surprisingly builder-friendly contracts say there is a sole discretion of the builder to decide where to subcontract. We, of course, recommend when acting on the buyer side that you should request to at least uh, add a requirement for a private, uh, prior written consent by the buyer. In any event, very important, and we see that later in the context of assignments, the builder should be fully responsible for whatever part of the work 
to build a subcontract. To control what's going on at the yard, to see the progress, and if it's in time and in satisfaction, the buyer has the right to appoint a representative that could be, of course, more than one person usually, and you could change your, your team um, uh, with different individuals depending on, on the time they are staying there at the yards on a day-to-day -day basis. Some builders insist on the right to request replacement if they think the, um, the representative of the buyer is not suitable to fulfill his job. The builder also will insist that the authority is clearly set out towards the, towards the buyer, builder by the buyer. Of course, that has uh, advantages for both sides because uh, you as a buyer want to know uh, the scope of authority in terms of amendments because key amendments um, usually are subject to, to, to approval uh, by, by the buyer itself and not just by the representative. They are there to supervise the construction of the vessel, to be in accordance with the building contract. They have the right to attend tests, inspect the vessel at all times. They should have free access to be present is often agreed under the contract to be a waiver of buyer's uh, rights, worth to note at a later stage. We already indicated there might be uh, a situation where you want to modify or change the terms of a contract because you have come to the conclusion you want to change the construction of the vessel because for further needs. I think here on that point, you always have to differentiate between the must-haves and the nice-to-haves. You will always look into the rules and regulations which apply upon signing the contract. And of course, they may change over time. And depending on, on your position on the negotiations, the, the most regular situation you're ending up will be if there is a change, you have to notify the builder and you have to agree on that change usually against an adjustment of the purchase price. You can try to negotiate better but that might be difficult. This may have as mentioned um, earlier effects on the timeline and, and the effect could be if you are not deciding quickly enough on what to agree uh, this may also add further delay. An aspect of relevance is also there are supplies to be provided by the buyer. So those supplies are something you have to hand over, if you are the buyer, to the yard that they can complete the vessel, complete the construction as agreed in the specification. To meet the building schedule, you have to be in time as per the plans. The buyers have to provide the builder with the instructions, test reports, as an advice, how to install the supplies which come out of the sphere of the buyers. Again, any failure here could result in an extension of the delivery date. The builder is not uh, re responsible for quality, performance and efficiency as this rests with the buyer, but he has to store and safe keep those items in, at his premises. We are getting closer to a completed vessel, We're making good progress. We are now having the trial runs and the completion. These are the decisive moment where the representatives of the buyer and the classification society will use the vessel for this trial run to see if the vessel is completed in compliance with the agreed contract and specifications. There will be in your contract a very sophisticated scheme for notifications when to attend. And we will also here see most likely um, the right of the builder to say you have waived the attendance rights because it didn't appear. So that is of course to protect the builder uh, that the buyer cannot delay the process by simply not appearing, but that is obviously a typical example for a very, very builder-friendly term. 
You will see also agreements on weather conditions, communication in English that you can follow what the people on the, on the ship and at the yard say during trial runs. Consumable stores may be already provided by, by the buyer because he has certain requirements for bunkers and loops. When this has all been done satisfactory, there is a technical acceptance of the vessel. The formal declaration by the buyer, or it could be the rejection, of course, but if we want to move forward, there is the technical acceptance upon which you have a, a certain period of time when the transfer of title passes. So you will then be in an area, you, you know, from, from secondhand deliveries with a few adjustments, for example, on the delivery documents where you have, for example, require from the yard an evidence of non-registration because your future flag will require that, a builder certificate, much more class certificates and plans. You also will be asked on the contract um, by, uh, by the builder to remove your vessel quickly to get the space, to get the slot free for, for, for other uh, projects. Now your vessel is floating and operating and hopefully earning uh, a decent hire under, under the employment. You have a guarantee period of usually up to 12 months from the actual delivery date. This is a scheme which can be of very, uh, very rel uh, practical relevance because the question is, if there is a, a defect, who is repairing it when the vessel is floating? around far away from the yards. There are, uh, there are mechanics that the owner is doing that on his own and then sending an invoice to, to the yard for payment, but that is of course much more complicated in the contract. The responsibility for subcontractors will rest with the yard, as mentioned earlier, unless you receive an assignment. I think uh, I mentioned already the assignment innovation, which is, being conscious of time, in a nutshell, relevant if you have pre-delivery financing secured. It's mainly equity finance in the pre-delivery phase. The debt finance comes in later, these days at least. But nonetheless, if you have financing, you want to be sure you can assign the rights or even you want, you want to innovate the contract to an affiliate or in favor of market situations to a third party. The default, I skip for now, it's quite obvious what you read there, but that is very much linked to Charles' part we come to in a moment. So therefore, just as a sum up on, on miscellaneous clauses, you will always see it's about tax and duties, trademarks, patterns and copyrights may be of relevance if you have added part of the design. You will usually see English law and London arbitration unless you have a very special situation where a Norwegian owner by, orders a vessel by a Norwegian yard, for example, or in any other country. The technical disputes might be solved by the classification society. Um, and it's worth to note that you have effectiveness discussions when the contract becomes effective upon financing approvals, shareholder approvals, or even provision of guarantees. As well as a very last note, you have insurance uh, terms for the, for, for the side of the builder and the buyer. This all is my run through the contract structure and I'm now very happy to hand over to Charles for the guarantees. Thank you, Christian. Um, as I knew you'd overrun your allotted uh, space, Christian, I've done very full notes of mine. So if you want to cut me off halfway into my talk, um, then at least everyone listening will be able to read my uh, full notes and hopefully pick up what I was going to say. So I'm going to talk to you about two kinds of guarantees, advanced payment guarantees, often referred to as performance guarantees, which are issued from the buyer side and refund guarantees, which are issued from the yards side. If I could have the next slide. <clears throat> so, um, uh, uh, dealing with advance payment guarantees first, uh, a lot of the issues uh, arise uh, on both of these guarantees dovetail. I'll deal with a APGs, let's call them that, to save time first. These uh, are typically required in the uh, cargo ship market by 
shipyards because buyers typically are single purpose vehicle companies and they are required to provide a parent guarantee or sometimes a bank APG, which secures the buyer's commitment to pay the pre-delivery installments. Now, these guarantees are important to yards. Firstly, they're important to protect against counterparty risk of default in payment of those installments, because we are dealing here not actually with a, a one ship company. We're actually dealing with a no ship company, a company that hasn't yet taken delivery of even one ship, uh, as they were described in that recent case cited on the slide. But more importantly, a yard needs the cash flow to continue the instruction uh, project. And that's why it is vital that the yard gets paid on time. And indeed, even if there is a dispute as to whether a relevant milestone instalment has been properly claimed, the yard still needs the money. And for that reason, these uh, instruments are typically drafted as performance bonds. So they are guarantees that are payable, even if the buyer disputes the yard's demand for payment. For example, because the buyer contests that the ship has been properly launched and so that the launch installment is not due. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, if yards make demands on uh, payment, advance payment guarantees because they're not paid in installment. That is likely because the buyer doesn't have the uh, funding to, uh, uh, to, 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 to perform the, pro uh, the, the, the contract. And so one uh, demand uh, will likely be followed by another demand for each successive uh, uh, pre-delivery installment. And the draconian nature of these instruments is well illustrated in one case in which a Greek bank that had given an APG of the buyer's obligations was ordered to pay the second installment under a shipbuilding contract, despite the fact that by the time the uh, issue uh, came to court, the arbitration tribunal that had been separately appointed under the shipbuilding contract in the dispute between the buyer and the shipyard had already actually decided that the second installment wasn't due because the refund guarantee that the yard had tended to obtain that payment was defective. However, the demand made of the Greek bank was made in good faith and on reasonable grounds and the Greek bank therefore couldn't rely on the underlying buyer's defences because we were dealing with a performance guarantee. And indeed in that case, the court held that once that payment had been made to the yard, the bank simply became an unsecured creditor of that yard. And the bank had actually argued that the money it paid to the yard should be held on trust for it, which would effectively ring fence it from the yard's other creditors. But no, that argument failed. So you can see these performance bonds are very strict instruments. They require payment to keep the cash flow, to keep the project going. Now, as a matter of English law, whether uh, a guarantee will be construed as a demand guarantee or demand bond or performance guarantee, or whether it will be construed as a traditional guarantee under which you can raise defences if you contest that the payment is due, will depend on a number of factors, and they're called the pa Paget presumptions. And they're listed at the bottom of that slide. And typically, they apply in the shipbuilding contract uh, context because yes one of the presumptions is do the parties to the underlying contract here the shipping contract are they in different jurisdictions typically they will be uh, will the guarantee contain wording excluding defenses available to the guarantee uh, at all probably not will the undertaking be to pay on demand yes it probably will be and will the bank uh, will the guarantor be a bank or financial institution probably yes it will be next slide please although in the shipbuilding context, this has been widened. So, for example, refund, uh, uh, refund guarantees and indeed advanced payment guarantees are sometimes given by insurance companies. And that's held not to be a problem in terms of construing these instruments as demand bonds. And indeed, in, a very, in the recent Shanghai shipyard case, uh, we were dealing simply with a parent guarantee. But the judge rightly uh, 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 observed that this was a substantial parent entity 
And that ultimately, you could say that a well-resourced and reputable trading company in an accessible jurisdiction actually gives better protection to a shipyard against counterparty risk than a uh, bank possibly with a political affilia affiliations operating in an undeveloped jurisdiction. So the, the key takeaway with these APGs is typically they are construed as performance guarantees. Now, when uh, uh, buyers come to re review a draft shipbuilding contract, they will usually append Annex 1, there will be the performance guarantee, and Annex 2, there will be the refund guarantee. And the typical buyer... Uh, 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 wording that buyers try and negotiate in to, the, uh, to their own parent guarantees is to include a paragraph that says if the guarantor, uh, sorry, if there is a dispute under the shipbuilding contract that's been reviewed to, our, uh, referred to arbitration, that will entitle the guarantor to withhold and defer payment until an arbitration award has been made. Now, sometimes yards agree, not, not often, but sometimes yards agree to those words being included. Well, what's the effect? Because you have a, an instrument that looks very much like a demand bond, but it has this strange paragraph sitting in it that says, well, if there's a dispute that's been referred to arbitration, we don't have to pay. Well, the courts have reconciled uh, these because they've seen uh, the, 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 these words apparently sitting uncomfortably together on a number of occasions. And they simply say, well, if by the time the demand is made of the under the guarantee, no arbitration has been commenced, then you've got a performance bond, then you have to meet the demand. But if it hasn't, then you've got a traditional guarantee. So the key point, uh, uh, the key takeaway for a buyer is if you do get that wording uh, included, then absolutely make sure if you dispute a payment that you immediately refer the dispute to arbitration because that will then defer the obligation of your parent to meet a, a, a demand under the guarantee. And of course, in that case, the, 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 the buyer had neglected to do so. And as I've put in the slide, the yard's unlikely to want to score an own goal by itself commencing arbitration, because that will just relieve the guarantor of its obligation to pay the instalment. So next slide, please. I mean, I, I, I'll try and race through this very quickly. Our experience recently is that although Far Eastern Yards typically do ask for uh, uh, advanced payment guarantees from parents, they may be relatively relaxed as to how substantial the guarantee they get is. And indeed, in some cases, I've even seen guarantees being offered by an entity which is simply an intermediate parent whose only assets are the its shares in the um, uh, the SPV buyer, uh, but that obviously has been enough to enable the yard to tick a box and say that it's got a guarantee. And that has some logic in the sense that if you're paying at least 30%, at least 40% uh, of the price up front, the yard is in effect secured by the advance payments that it gets from the buyer and the, um, uh, you know, the value of the partially completed hull that it's sitting on. So uh, there may be scope to negotiate out the requirement for an advance payment guarantee, or at least to negotiate down the uh, uh, credit worthiness of the uh, entity that offers the guarantee. Uh, and I, I say this bearing in mind that getting such guarantees out of traditional lenders since uh, the credit crunch of a decade, more than a decade ago, is now very difficult. Banks are very unwilling uh, to provide these instruments unless they get very substantial additional um, uh, security from the uh, buying entity. Can I have the next slide, please? So let's move to refund guarantees. Uh, refund guarantees secure the buyer's right to be refunded uh, it's prepaid instalments when it cancels for builder's default. So we're talking about delay in delivery, possibly excessive force majeure delay, possibly failure of the vessel uh, following um, uh, uh, completion of uh, 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 sea trials to meet the technical requirements, total loss, uh, or possibly yard insolvency. Now of those defaults by far the most common are delay in delivery and to a lesser degree uh, shipyard insolvency. I mention 
uh, shipyard insolvency also because the usual form of shipbuilding contract will not give a buyer a right to cancel if the yard uh, goes insolvent. Typically that uh, right has to be uh, expressly negotiated in. And even if it is negotiated in, it is unlikely to cover corporate rehabilitation processes which fall short of a uh, liquidation process. And so whilst we have seen yard insolvencies and Far Eastern yard insolvencies are becoming more frequent, very often they are not, um, they are a chapter 11 or you know, a, a debtor rehabilitation type of insolvency rather than, a, rather than a, a, a winding up. Refund guarantees do not secure buyer's claims for damages if a buyer terminates the shipbuilding contract under its general legal rights, or buyer's claims for losses over and above the refund of the sums that have been prepaid by the time of the cancellation, plus interest. So they don't cover the buyer's supervision costs, cost of its buyer's supplies, any accrued liquidated damages, and consequential losses such as lost uh, charters or charter earnings, or indeed the buyer's finance costs. So when a buyer enters into a shipbuilding contract, it needs to have in mind that uh, it, uh, uh, the rate of interest that, that it agrees uh, to apply to uh, uh, its refund should really factor in whatever other costs it thinks it might uh, 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 suffer on any uh, cancellation. Now, very importantly, a refund guarantee does not cover the yard's obligations to account the resale proceeds if the yard cancels. That sounds like it wouldn't happen much, but it can happen. Because if by the time, say, the yard cancels the contract, the hull is substantially complete and substantial installments have been paid, even if there's a market downturn, the value of the uh, uh, hull plus the prepaid installments may well um, uh, exceed uh, the, the the sums for which the yard can legitimately claim, namely the price. And so the yard would, in such event, have an obligation to uh, uh, to repay that surplus to the buyer. Well, that's not covered by a refund guarantee. Uh, moving to the next slide, please. Now, shipbuilding contracts are inherently risky projects like all um, uh, construction projects uh, in terms of their price, because the price is agreed in market X uh, on the basis of delivery taking place a number of years later in a totally different market. Uh, added to that, delay in ship building is common because firstly, and probably most importantly, yards tend to give buyers optimistic delivery dates to get the uh, work in, uh, but they also get into delay on other projects which have knock-on effects. They are not, uh, certainly Chinese, many Chinese yards are not particularly good at controlling flash, uh, cash flow or labor costs. And indeed the yard has its own capital costs particularly the price of steel, which fluctuates and can cause the yard cash flow or financial difficulties. Now, obviously, if a project is delayed, the buyer and the yard can agree to extend the delivery date as long as the refund guarantee is extended. But the yard, or sorry, the, at least the buyer will not want to do so without a discount if by the time uh, the uh, a, a right to cancel for delay has arisen, the contracts become overpriced or even frankly, if it hasn't come become overpriced, the buyer has lost its finance commitment or charter, or just generally the buyer has lost confidence in the yard's ability to complete the vessel. And uh, 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 so, so cancellations for delay in this context are not in common. Uh, likewise, shipyards do go insolvent, and we have seen them increasingly enter into formal insolvency in corporate rescue processes. So we are, we have been involved in a number of uh, buyer cancellations in the event of uh, 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 yards filing for insolvency processes in China and Korea uh, in particular. Now, if you don't get a refund guarantee, what's your alternative? Well, if you don't have any security, then every time you make a payment, you're obviously an unsecured creditor of a uh, foreign, uh, usually shipyard, uh, 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 which is far from ideal. 
uh, you could, as an alternative, take a mortgage over the hull under construction, but these arrangements are fraught with difficulty. Firstly, and probably most importantly, the value of the partially completed hull on any cancellation is likely not to be uh, more and, and like to be substantially less than the value of the installments that you've prepaid. Possession is nine tenths of the law and the yard will retain possession of the partially completed yard hull. So moving it may be difficult, you may face resistance and it may just be impracticable and uh, 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 disproportionately costly. Even if you get a mortgage, um, uh, the risk of that security being avoided on a yard insolvency, if at the time the yard uh, granted that security, it was uh, 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 later deemed to be insolvent, uh, it, it is not insignificant. And if you're taking an under construction mortgage in the flag state, that may not even be recognized in the yard's jurisdiction or not properly recognized. And even if you do have recognition, recognition. Typically, this kind of security will be subject to liens of local creditors such as subcontractors of the yard. And to add you know, to the list, that security will definitely not cover items that haven't yet been incorporated into the vessel. Can I have the next slide, please? <clears throat> so when you get a refund guarantee, most importantly, who is giving it to me? Ideally, I want a bank. I want a uh, a, a bank with a high credit rating, and I want an international bank with typically branches outside, for example, China, so I don't actually go and ever have to enforce or even contemplate enforcing an award if I, uh, or judgment if it gets that far against a uh, local bank in a, uh, a, 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 a foreign company, uh, a foreign country. If I am going to take a refund guarantee from an insurance company or a local or regional bank, et cetera, uh, very important to do due diligence as to the credit worthiness and credit rating of that um, uh, uh, entity. I should have in mind, and as I said, bear in mind that the you know when the, the moment you sign the you, you ink up as brokers say the shipbuilding contract, you will be signed. You will be agreeing to the form of refund guarantee and APG, and so and only then may as a as a ship owner may you be going off and trying to raise finance. You need to have regard. Is it is this is the refund guarantee wording that I've agreed to? Is it bankable? So, as an obvious point, I can't through, go through the whole list. But for example, is the refund guarantee expressed to be assignable to the buyer's lender? Because the buyer's lender will want an assignment of that refund guarantee as part of its security. If you're getting pre-delivery finance of any kind, now these refund guarantees they're typically issued through uh, the Swift Bank messaging system. And often when you see the draft, you'll see a stream of indigestible text, all in capital letters, sometimes not even broken up into paragraphs. The yards in the Far Eastern Yards will typically say that that's the form of refund guarantee that their bank requires and it's non-negotiable, et cetera. Well, they are negotiable. That's just not true. They clearly are negotiable and uh, it's a, a false economy to uh, not get um, legal input into uh, the refund guarantee wording. <clears throat> the first point is the one we've seen with APGs. Is the refund guarantee a demand bond or is it a traditional guarantee? Well, again, sometimes buyers press for demand bonds, but the, the situation of a buyer is quite different uh, to that of a shipyard. The yard needs the cash flow to continue with the project. The buyer, it's very nice to get your refund as soon as you can after cancellation, but you're not quite in the critical position of the shipyard with an ongoing uh, project at the time of a cancellation. So uh, 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 you can try and negotiate for a performance bond, but yards very rarely give it. And, and indeed, in my experience, pretty much the only time I've seen yards give performance refund guarantees is by mistake. They didn't actually realize that they were uh, giving such an instrument. So can I have the next slide? All banks require expiry dates to guarantees and uh, refund guarantee banks in the Far East are no exception. And so the key point for the buyer to make absolutely sure is that there is a sufficient cushion of time between the first date on which the buyer can cancel for delay in a delayed project because that's the main form of cancellation that will ever happen, and the expiry date. 
and you have to factor in all the potential delays and probably then add some because along the way people agree time extensions uh, and then forget to make the adjustment to the refund guarantee so you need to be in a position where at the time you come to cancel in a delayed project time still uh, run there's still still time to run on the refund guarantee now if there isn't and this happens and we've been involved in a number of cases where it doesn't happen there are a number of creative arguments that one can um, uh, come up with, none of them uh, are, are, are perfect. What we would say as a drafting point to avoid this risk is rather than agonizing over the expiry date in the refund guarantee, put in your shipbuilding contract a right to cancel the building contract if there is less than a certain number of days to run on the refund guarantee and the builder then fails to procure a refund guarantee extension because that effectively gives you a right to get an evergreen um, refund guarantee if ever um, time starts to run out. You also need to have a clause that makes absolutely clear that if changes to the shipbuilding contract are agreed they will not discharge the refund guarantee bank from liability. And this is important because with traditional guarantees under English law, uh, if you agree a change to the underlying contract, in this case, the shipbuilding contract, and you don't get the refund guarantor's consent, if it is material, that will operate to discharge the guarantor from liability. So for example, if you agree to a price increase or a delay in the delivery date, that will be material and the refund guarantees commitment will disappear. Now, obviously good practice is always to get the refund guarantors consent when uh, these kinds of agreement are reached. But uh, rather than because mistakes are made, the easiest way is to negotiate wording into the guarantee that simply says that uh, the guarantor waives its right to object to uh, or take a point on or to obtain defenses from uh, such variations made without its consent. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, that anti-discharge wording will cover you pretty much for all the usual kinds of changes that you may make to the shipbuilding contract, changes to the specs, etc. But there are arguments that there's a limit. So if I contracted to build a bulker and then the bulk market collapsed and I changed to build a tanker, well, arguably that would be a change so significant that it goes beyond what the judges have called the purview of the refund guarantee but it seems inconceivable in such a case that the buyer wouldn't go and make sure that the refund guarantor was signed up to such a significant um, uh, uh, change and indeed in one case a, a price increase of 40 percent uh, exercised the court as to whether that uh, went beyond the purview of uh, the uh, uh, original guarantee and that had been agreed uh, in, an, in relation to a semi-submersible uh, uh, rig, um, uh, 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 whether that fell outside the, uh, the original guarantee towards liability. <clears throat> uh, given that we are running out of time, I'm gonna race through my, original, uh, my, my remaining points. The last point on that page is about signing, because uh, there were a spate of refund guarantees that weren't signed. Um, and uh, uh, under English law, guarantees to be valid have to be have to be signed. Uh, it, uh, it's been largely clarified by the fact that if you issue a guarantee through SWIFT, the act of authenticating a SWIFT probably uh, uh, will suffice in place of a signature block. Next slide, please. Uh, those are some miscellaneous points. If anyone wants to ask me a question about it in a Q&A, they can. I'll move on to the next. And likewise, I won't deal with assignments because Christian basically um, uh, 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 covered that topic. So I'm afraid I've slightly overrun, but hopefully not too much. Thank you for your patience. Thanks, Charles. So, so did I. So uh, thank you very much for your for your time and insight in, in, in what you have seen uh, on the topic. So turning to to um, Charles, I think the, the, the answer you're typing, I, I want to re read out the question loud because I think it's a, of, of interest to, to many. So we have received um, a question about um, about so you answered the question but i want to show there's a due date for each installment three business days after for example steel cutting 15th of october 
And the question there is, if the date by which the buyer remit the funds uh, has to receive, if the funds are not received then and there's a delay beyond buyer's direct control, uh, is that a buyer's default? Um, so you're already answering it, but that the people can say, maybe you can well, answer. Quick question, why, sorry, why don't I answer it? I, I, no, please, I, please, for everyone's benefit. I mean, it, it's an interesting point. Under English law, a payment is deemed made when it is received and um, uh, not when it is paid. And when you are paying a Chinese yard, for example, in foreign currency dollars, and you're remitting from, for example, your Greek bank, so the money is going through clearing in New York and eventually being credited to the yard's account in China, Typically, the yard will not receive your payment for at least one banking day and quite often two or three uh, banking days. And uh, I'm actually I've actually had a case where um, uh, well, I've had a number of cases where when it comes to agreeing the liquidated damages, the yard will come up with a list of the days on which it received the uh, pre-delivery installments and they will claim automatic permissible delay for the three day or whatever period between each um, uh, uh, between each of the, uh, the, 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 you know, the payment demands that they made and the dates on which they actually got the funds in China. Because typically, shipbuilding contracts say that for every day of every day of delay in payment of any of the pre-delivery instalments is permissible delay. So that is delay that goes to reduce the yard's uh, liability to liquidated damages. Yeah, this often comes and um, uh, the, the first time the buyer even becomes aware of the fact that uh, there'd been any delay in the banking system is when it comes to ask to receive or to deduct from the balance on delivery. It's liquidated damages. Oh. So yes, in answer to that question, <clears throat> uh, I would say yeah, at the end of that, I mean, there's nothing one can do about it other than um, so Pay, pay as soon as possible. So, no, sending early. Sending Send early, early and, and also have in mind <clears throat> every day I delay, even if the contract, even if, for example, as typically these shipbuilding contracts will say that you're only in default and the yard can only actually cancel if, you know, you don't, you fail to pay, let's say, within seven days of a default notice. Well, some buyers take the view, okay, well, as long as I pay, the installment before the default notice or before the yard as long as, long as i avoid a risk of cancellation then I, i'm in no particular hurry to pay well that's that that's right in one sense but remember <laughs> every day you don't pay you are losing a day of liquidated damages in terms uh, 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 in the event the project becomes delayed no, absolutely appreciated your answer. I think on the on the on the next, I think the next question, just to see that we can 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 tackle a few. Um, that there was a question uh, if power cuts uh, in in China affecting productivity of shipyards is a force major major event. Uh, uh, my 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 most recent uh, shipbuilding contract we brought to signing, in fact, explicitly said <clears throat> that the electricity provision if cut off, it would be um, a force majeure event. Um, I'm not sure if you have any specific other experience with that question on, on electricity, but <clears throat> I think most likely it will be. Christian, it, it is a in Far Eastern building contracts, uh, prolonged um, uh, 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 power cuts are, are, are always a force majeure yeah. event. And they do happen. The issue that I see from a, in, in the dispute side when these uh, are, are claimed is, of course, the buyer's supervisory team will be sitting there at the shipyard saying, well, we didn't see any interruption in the work. And um, of course, depending on your contract, but typically it's not enough for the yard simply to say there was a power cut. The yard has to show the consequential uh, delay to progress and uh, you, you know depends whether quite often these power cuts are happening not at the yard site but somewhere 
locally where there is a subcontractor working on something and um, one has to be uh, vigilant as to whether, <clears throat> whether, whether the relevant power cut actually stop work. And my own sense is that the best evidence is your site supervisory team. Indeed, the best evidence I've seen is where the site supervisory team goes and takes timed dated videos of the work that was going on on the day that the relevant force majeure was claimed. Yeah. Well, okay, that, that goes in, in, into a, a lot of details if, if you are not there. But, but thanks for that. I think, I think there is one question, what happens if the, if, if the refund guarantee is not issued within a specified uh, timeline if, if bars can cancel? I think um, we touched on that briefly in terms of effectiveness. I think you can combine the effectiveness of the contract with the provision of the refund guarantee. So if the refund guarantee is not being issued, the contract as such becomes not effective, which you should combine with a drop that date uh, until you can um, a, a walk, a walk away. Uh, and otherwise, if that is not a subject to effectiveness, it, it, it would be a default to, to cancel the contract, right? If the refund guarantee is not provided. And, uh, different contracts approach this question diff differently. Um, what I can tell you that English case law establishes that if a yard signs a contract with you, and then the market moves up and the yard decides, I don't really want to uh, uh, stick with that commitment. So I'll just make sure that I don't get a, a refund guarantee for this because I'll, 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 I'll resell the slot to a different buyer for a better price in the improving market. Were you to have evidence of that, you could sue the yard for damages. And in, in, in one case, a buyer successfully did. So, um, yes, it is true that shipbuilding contracts typically say that until the yard provides the refund guarantee for the first instalment, the contract is not effective. But that doesn't just give the yard a free option to say, OK, well, if the market goes up and I can resell the slot for a better price to somebody, mm. I'm free to do so. Um, uh, yeah. the, the court will imply a term that the yard has to use effectively its best endeavors to get that refund guarantee. Sure. Okay. Now that, that's understood and, and uh, satisfied. I, I think at least the expectation that they cannot simply walk away by not providing the refund guarantee. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the best would be we answer all your questions. We have a, a few still open. We answer those by email, um, but, but having invited for an hour and in, in respect of all your schedules being, 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 uh, busy, I guess. Um, may I thank you all again that you have taken the time. Um, thanks to your shorts again. I think you and I would be absolutely happy to, to, to take, catch up with you on, on this topic afterwards. So feel free to call uh, or email us. And apart from that, stay safe and healthy. And I hope we see and uh, speak soon. So all the best to everyone and goodbye.